there is one dinosaur that has gotten the most amount of attention in the past couple of years, it's Spinosaurus. But as it turns out, it wasn't that special. At least by the standard of individuality, since we had another Spinosaur that was almost identical in skeleton and nearly in size occupying South America, named Oxalia. Spinosaurids are one of my favourite dinosaur groups. Now, I've done a whole video dedicated to the clade, but there are some great individuals that I didn't go into much detail about, one of the most interesting of which was this guy. Back in 1999, paleontologist Elaine Mercado of the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro came across these findings when exploring the Alcantara Formation in northeast Brazil. Recovered were two upper jaw fragments, one from part of the premaxilla and the other from the maxilla. Now granted, this doesn't sound like a lot, but you would be amazed about how much can be inferred from just a little bit of comparative morphology and proportional dimensions. In the end, this fragmentary material was seen as enough 12 years later to describe as a new genus, Oxalia quilombensis. From this, paleontologists were able to estimate that the overall skull would have been very close to Spinosaurus at a glance. The difference is here being Oxalia's skull was proportionately shorter and deeper, with the entire rostrum leading up to the cranium being more straight in profile. The notch seen at the end of all Spinosaurus' mouths was also much shallower than Spinosaurus itself, as well as the end of its snout, often called the terminal rosette, that is characteristic of Spinosaurids, being much more rounded in profile. Overall, the estimated size of the skull was around 1.35 meters or 4.4 feet long, being around a foot and a half shorter than Spinosaurus. From this, a total size estimate of Oxalia was extrapolated at approximately 12 to 14 meters or 39 to 46 feet long and between 5 and 7 tons in weight making Oxalia the biggest terrestrial carnivore to ever come out of Brazil. Now, if this animal was as closely related as we think it was to Spinosaurus, it's not difficult to imagine what the rest of the animal looked like. Going beyond that straighter snout, we see a skull that is remarkably crocodile-like, lined with conical, non-serrated teeth that might not have been the best at cutting through flesh, but was ideal for spearing fish. Whilst we're on the teeth, Oxalia does show another strange distinction, especially for a theropod. Oxalia actually had a total of two replacement teeth stored for when the first fell out, replacing its teeth at a much faster rate when compared to other theropods. If Oxalia shared its ornamentation with Spinosaurus, it likely had a small crest atop its nasal ridge, something that probably was used in order to show off to potential mates. As we go further along, we see a relatively long neck for a theropod, retaining an almost swan-like posture in order to accommodate the quick and powerful vertical movements that we know Spinosaurians were particularly good at. Then we get to the most striking feature that Oxalia likely had, and that is the huge sail across its back, which would have been made up of the extended spinous processes of the vertebrae. Now the exact shape it took is unknown, but there is an overall agreement that these sails created a slight M shape, with the back end of the sail dropping down slightly sharper than the front end. We then get to those infamous legs. Now, Spinosaurids in general had fairly short legs for theropods, since much of their hunting didn't really require running across land. This is at its most extreme, however, with Spinosaurus itself, and so, by proxy, likely Oxalia as well. They may seem odd and cumbersome, and would mostly have made them very slow on land, but those short legs were a hell of a lot more handy when streamlining for swimming through water. Hydrodynamics likely would also play a role in the shape of Oxalia's tail as well. Rather than the regular cylindrical tail shared by other theropods, Oxalia's tail would have probably been another feature shared with today's crocodilians being laterally compressed in order to create a paddle structure that aided in swimming. Now, I've mentioned swimming a few times with these Spinosaurids, which is contentious to those in the know and possibly given the wrong impression to those not. So let me explain. The plethora of semi-aquatic features seen on Spinosaurus led researchers initially to surmise that these were excellent swimmers. However, after the paddle tail was found, other researchers created hydrodynamic simulations in which they found that Spinosaurus was physically unable to swim fast enough to catch anything, nor could it actually dive underneath the water. So it had all these aquatic features, but wasn't a very good swimmer. What's going on? Well, they probably didn't need to be particularly quick or powerful swimmers. One theory that many, including myself, have subscribed to is the heron model, in which animals like Spinosaurus and Oxalia would wade through the waters and find a spot to wait in before snapping up any fish that comes their way. 
They may have done this by retracting that swan-like neck with their jaws in the water, seeing as the nostrils are much higher up, allowing them to breathe. Sensitive pressure receptors seen on the snout will let Oxalia know when something has swum along, and then it would use that quick and powerful vertical movement to strike at its prey, and using those massive falling claws to help grasp it. So rather than trying to pursue the smaller, quicker and more agile fish, it simply waits like a heron for food, and any time spent in the water is efficient thanks to those aquatic features without having to spend a load of energy exerting itself. Whilst we're on lifestyle, we should probably come back to that sale as well. Now the function of this thing is naturally known, but it's very likely that it comes down to one of two things, and that is either display or thermoregulation. It could have used this sail by filling it with blood and using that to either collect heat from the sun to transport around the body or shedding excess heat, with an animal of this size needing as much surface area as possible to do the latter. But if this sail was for display, it was purely to impress a mate and make itself appear larger to rivals. Likely being brightly coloured, it would have also come in handy in telegraphing its existence to potential mates or warning off those rivals, whilst the rest was submerged in water waiting for food, so that hunting would not have to interfere with the animal's constant display. Then again, it doesn't actually have to be an either or situation. Maybe it did both or neither, and it's actually something that we haven't thought of yet. So that's potentially how it was living its life, but what about the where? The Alcantara Formation of Brazil was deposited during the late Cretaceous between 100.5 to 93.9 million years ago, a time when the continents were starting to look recognisable but were much closer together. South America in particular had not long broken away from Africa and was still very close to it, with the location of Brazil aligning fairly close to where Spinosaurus hailed from. Now, these two Spinosaurids weren't actually the only things that these two locations had in common. This area was remarkably similar to the Kemkem beds of Morocco, in which Spinosaurus fossils are found, being a very humid habitat dominated by tropical forests, with the land becoming more and more arid as one got further inland from the coast. Occupying this region were various pterosaurs, crocodilomorphs, turtles and snakes, along with fish very similar to northern Africa at the time to feed Oxalia, including Argonodus, Atlanticopristus, Oncopristus, Ceratodus, and the giant Morsonia. Dinosaurs of this region include sauropods such as Malawisaurus and Itapiosaurus, some indeterminate ornithopod and theropods such as Carcharodontosaurids, Jameosaurs, Abelosaurids, and potentially other Spinosaurs. But the presence of other Spinosaurs is another contentious point, mostly thanks to Sigil Massasaurus. Sigil Massasaurus is yet another Spinosaurid which is so similar to Spinosaurus itself, many argue that it shouldn't be its own genus, much like Oxalia. Specimens of this theropod have also been found in the Alcantara Formation as well as in Africa, but are limited to vertebrae. So this raises a few questions if these triplets weren't all just Spinosaurus. Mainly, how did an animal like Sigil Massasaurus that was so similar to Oxalia and Spinosaurus coexist with them at the same time? Its presence and status as a very different animal implies that Oxalia would have faced some very real rivalry that it was able to avoid with all the other theropods thanks to its specialization, so much so that one would have likely outcompeted the other. The only solution here would be that this was simply the same animal as Spinosaurus and Oxalia, or that there are some serious morphological differences that we don't know about that change their lifestyle enough not to step on each other's toes. But the jury is out on that one, which means that I want you guys to let me know what you think about the relationship between Spinosaurus, Oxalia, and Sigil Massasaurus. Either way, Oxalia soon left this world, likely thanks to the same reason as Spinosaurus, with a steep loss in habitat occurring thanks to either constant droughts or sea level changes. Which will take us very smoothly onto today's question, which comes from Christian Newling3859, who's asked, I know this sounds silly, but do you think it's possible that any dinosaurs survived to today? Apart from the obvious, like crocs, etc. You hear stories of some being sighted today. What's your take on this? Uh, okay, so... Dinosaurs definitely did survive the KPG mass extinction when we include avians in the clade of Dinosauria. Uh, but I'm going to assume that you mean the non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, short answer, no I don't. Whilst I think there most certainly were plenty of dinosaurs around for a few years after the asteroid impact, since the worldwide effects of this wouldn't have happened in just one day, 
I do think that they had all died out by the time the paleo scene was well underway. And it's doubtful that sightings would be made today and nothing shows up in the fossil record, which not only shows the lack of dinosaurs, but also shows how the world overall changed due to their absence, with other groups evolving and diversifying to fill the gaps that they left. And like I stressed in my Halloween special last year, if their numbers are low enough to only have unconfirmed sightings, it's highly unlikely that they would have sustained themselves for 66 million years. Now granted, we did think that coelacanths went extinct at the same time before discovering that they somehow avoided fossilization or discovery for the entire Cenozoic right up until the 1930s. But that's an animal that exists in limited places in the largely unexplored waters rather than being land animals that are more likely to be officially sighted. No one would love for non-avian dinosaurs to be around today more than me, but unfortunately I just don't think they are. Anyway, thank you as ever for submitting that question and to everyone else for watching this far. If you have enjoyed this video, then please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you haven't already so that I can catch you guys next time.